Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar with the Cutting Crime Impact Project, short CCI. My name is Margot Molkenbohr and I'm your host today on behalf of the German Prevention Congress. I have seen many familiar names in the, the list of attendees, which, which makes me very happy on the one hand. And um, on the other hand, that uh, means or that, that could mean that uh, you have uh, already attended one of our previous webinars and uh, know that we have done a 10 part webinar series together with the CCI project and that uh, this is now uh, the final one and uh, if you missed the past webinars no worries uh, you can watch the recordings on the DPT or the CCI website anytime. I would like to open the webinar with a quote from Russell Ackhoff that um, has been with me throughout the project. Uh, it says, we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. And um, I think this was very well taken into account in the project because uh, solutions were developed for real problem, problems um, identified by the law enforcement agencies that were involved. And um, now I hope that our speakers and uh, the other um, persons will, will join. Exactly. Hello, Oscar. Because, um, yes, I don't want to uh, reveal uh, too much um, because there is an interesting program waiting for us. Um, I would like to welcome our uh, speakers. Um, actually, I wanted to welcome uh, Dr. Raphael Bosong, but unfortunately, I have to inform you that uh, our keynote speaker is uh, ill and will probably not uh, be with us today. Um, we will see if he can join us later, but otherwise we'll have to start without him. And uh, then I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Caroline Davy and Andrew Wooten. And um, they will first reflect a little on the project and will then later on present a new version of a European uh, security model. And I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Oskar Strein, who will lead you through the webinar today. Uh, he studied law and philosophy, and his main research topic is uh, human dignity in the digital age. He is currently an assistant professor at the Department of uh, Governance and Innovation at the University of uh, Groningen, and is also partner in the CCI project. And before I hand over to you, Oscar, I would just like to say that the webinar will, will also be recorded and that we would like to invite you dear attendees uh, to, to share your questions and your comments with us. Uh, unfortunately, you do not have the opportunity to join in with your mic or your camera, but you can write in the uh, questions field. And uh, I would be happy if you uh, would test it. Um, I know that we have over 60 people registered today, and I know that you come from many different countries, so uh, feel free to try uh, the question field. Maybe say uh, or write a short hello from and uh, yeah, from which country you're sending your greetings. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, Oscar. The stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Margot. A warm welcome also from my side. Good morning. Um, I will keep it uh, rather brief. Uh, the topic of this webinar is Cutting Crime Impact, Framing a European Approach to Security Policy and Practice. And as Margot already said, so this is the 10th um, uh, webinar in this series. And we are uh, very privileged today to have the opportunity to uh, listen to the project uh, coordinators, so the masterminds uh, of this project who have been uh, with it and have been developing it, not only executing it for the last uh, little bit more than three years, as they will tell us, but also developing it in the past. And I can only uh, share that it was a big privilege for me personally, but also for my institution to be part of this project. I really learned a lot, especially when it comes to understanding uh, the issues at stake and uh, working on the toolkits, but also especially when it comes to the framing of the issues. And I think this is also something which we will uh, talk about today, how to frame, for instance, a European approach to security 
Um, and I, because we have a little bit more time, uh, it would really be great if uh, the the participants could uh, uh, really engage in the discussion that we after that we have afterwards. We have uh, enough space to do that, and we are really looking forward to the questions. But without uh, further ado, um, Caroline, Andrew, I would like to invite you to take the floor and start your presentation on uh, the CCI project, thinking back and looking forward. I think Andrew will. Uh, share his screen with us uh, in a bit and uh, yeah then um, we would love to hear from you how uh, you worked with the project and what you learned from the project and what your your takeaways are. Thank you very much Oscar. Um, yes I'm <coughs> Caroline Davey and I'm presenting today with um, Andrew Wooten and we're the directors of the Design Against Crime Solutions Centre at the University of Salford. Um, so we're going to be focusing then on the CCI project, um, thinking back to uh, what we've uh, learnt and also uh, looking forward. So um, just to remind you that um, CCI, as we call it, um, was a 36-month um, EU-funded project and it was funded by the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Fund. Um, obviously, because of COVID, there were um, a few adjustments that have to be made and it was extended to be um, 39 months. So it actually finishes at the end of December. And the consortium comprises um, 12 partners um, and at the heart of our consortium are our six law enforcement agencies um, from uh, police forces across Europe. So what we're going to be talking about today is then our emerging lessons and learning points, and we've got five of these. So the first um, is that European security research needs to focus more on understanding end user needs and their contexts. This was really the distinction that we had uh, within CCI, that we adopt a human-centered approach to understanding and addressing security problems. And as a result of this, then this focus on the end users in CCI, this was the LEAs, um, it prevented us from focusing on any specific technology as a solution in itself. We kept things open, we waited to find out what, was, what might be needed as a solution and we didn't presume that the solution should be a technology, but we were always open to the idea that it could be a solution if that was appropriate. So what we did was that we treated technology um, as a tool to be applied to well-defined and understood problems. And as Russell Ackoff says, we fail more often because we solve the wrong problem than because we get the wrong solution to the right problem. And so CCI was very much about this idea of problem framing, um, doing a lot of work to really understand what the problem is and to frame it in a way where you can develop um, a solution that actually has an impact and is suited to the end users. Um, thanks, Caroline. So the uh, second thing we wanted to raise was uh, the idea that security researchers and policymakers need to better address security issues impacting citizens' everyday quality of life. Um, so we're aware that particularly at the EU level, um, that there appears to be a focus on uh, what we've termed the big and scary security issues, um, uh, and and that tends to hog. Uh, a lot of the limelight so in terms of the funding and the attention. Um, but in terms of harms, um, actually citizen quality of life is uh, more impacted by everyday crime, um, which is uh, termed by the EU as petty crime, which is um, actually the term petty crime is within the title of the CCI project uh, because it was in the original call. But in English, petty uh, can tend to mean insignificant or unimportant, um, but uh, we suggest that actually these things that affect 
uh, everyday quality of life of citizens are not petty at all and that actually by focusing on these sort of things uh, that are affecting everyday life for citizens it actually uh, fosters a sense of legitimacy trust and engagement between citizens and law enforcement agencies um, and actually that's very important because we know that security is not something that's gifted to citizens but it's actually uh, it's something that's co-created with citizens uh, so this sense of working together and engagement and trust and legitimacy is very important to addressing some quite complex security issues and equally that legitimacy trust and engagement also impacts on some of these larger scary issues like uh, issues around organized crime or radicalization and counter-terrorism so uh, we feel that there needs to be uh, more focus on these everyday security issues as well so um, thirdly we think that um, security policy makers and practitioners should focus resource on prevention activities what we have sort of noted at the moment is that there has been a tendency to focus on current problems or issues rather than actually investing more in prevention and i think people would be more prepared to invest in prevention if they were actually aware of the evidence that exists showing that prevention really works um, we often in cci refer to the international crime victimization survey um, a very important methodology that actually talks to us um, and shows evidence about what is happening in terms of crime patterns um, across the world. And so that we know that there has been action to reduce burglary across Europe, and that has worked really effectively. In terms of crime prevention uh, through urban design and planning, there is a significant evidence base um, re regarding its value. And so knowing all these things, we should be investing much more in prevention. Um, so number four is that security policymakers and practitioners should exploit the benefits of collaborative problem solving more. So um, there still often appears to be the assumption that law enforcement or the police alone are responsible for tackling crime and insecurity. Um, and we suggest there's a need uh, to recognize the importance of partnership working uh, and to adopt methods that actually enable this. So being able to effectively map stakeholders and to be able to effectively work collaboratively uh, in problem solving. And this means understanding and working with end users excuse me, whoever they may be, citizens, partner organisations that operate in the same environments as law enforcement, uh, and especially civil society. Um, and then it also means ensuring that these relationships, these collaborative relationships are maintained uh, and are uh, seen as being of strategic importance. Uh, and so relationships with key stakeholders have continuity. Uh, on the project, two of the tools that were developed from CCI actually are related to this idea of collaborative working and problem solving. So the tool uh, PROHIC, developed by the Dutch National Police, uh, is about uh, in urban environments, um, the police and uh, various law enforcement aspects of the justice system working together to address uh, complex high impact crime problems. Uh, and in the GMP, Greater Manchester Police Community Connect uh, tool, that was about how the relationship between the police and partners in the community, not just citizens, but also partner organisations, was potentially being jeopardised because the relationships that were built up over time uh, were not being maintained um, because they weren't recognised as being of strategic importance uh, by the um, by the law enforcement agency itself and so when they moved people around uh, from different areas of the city these uh, key um, connections were being dropped and that was causing uh, issues in the sense of uh, people's relationship with each other with each other and their ability to work together so fifthly and finally um we found that um, law enforcement agencies are able to undertake meaningful end-user research 
and engage in human-centered innovation of practical tools. CCI has delivered a number of practical tools and these have been demonstrated and validated by end users. Um, and to be able to achieve this, what we found was that what is needed is a simple requirements capture method um, to guide um, LEAs and also a clear design process to guide the whole development of the tool itself. Um, what we used was a design process and uh, that goes through from discover, define, develop, deliver, deploy and digest. And what we did was then we mapped onto this model uh, from the design discipline, we mapped on then the work packages which related to um, CCI. And so in this, then we took um, our law enforcement agencies through a process from requirements capture to the generate through the generation of ideas to the development of a final tool. What we also did um, is that we had um, collaborative workshops, which were called design labs, and that enabled the insight that we gained from the requirements capture research to be transformed into design concepts. And that informed um, the um, solution directions that we then developed after the design lab. So in terms of how that worked, this gives you just sort of a flavor of here, we're working together in a design lab and we're starting off by mapping um, the various stakeholders um, that might be relevant to a particular problem or tool. We then went through a process of generating ideas, um, ideas that link to the requirements capture research and the themes that were identified. And then um, participants had to pitch their ideas um, to the other members of the design lab and we voted on the ideas. Um, but a lot of work was actually done after the design lab um, to then um, identify some solution directions using all that material. So through CCI, we've developed eight um, tools. All of them are excellent um, and we are developing um, web portals uh, that we will share, which will allow us to share then the tools that have been developed um, with everybody so that you can actually see for yourselves what has been developed. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I think I might have clicked back by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sorry. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for this very insightful and succinct uh, presentation of all the achievements of the project over the last years. It's great to see that it's possible to also summarize it in such clear messages, right? Because I think it was uh, such a rich process with so many different stakeholders. And I think what uh, sets the, the project apart was also really this emphasis on how end users will eventually include that actually in their work and what the type of problems are it's just not as Andrew I think always likes to put it, it's just not just dropping something and then that's it but really working with the community and and the broad community to implement all of this but you don't have to take that from me because uh, in the next uh, uh, section we are going to uh, have feedback from our reflections maybe is a better word from uh, several project partners who are sharing uh, what uh, CCI um, created for them, how the project um, worked with them and interrelated with their work and why they think that it is uh, special. So I think our hosts have prepared a video and I would invite them to play that back at this point if it is possible. So for us, this is very, very helpful uh, in order to take these outputs from the CCI project, the tools, uh, and bring them on to our cities, uh, try to transfer that knowledge. When it comes to this policing approach, the problems and the issues that the stakeholders experience are not necessarily in line with the big priorities and the agenda of the police force. 
our police force uh, because there's a mismatch be be between what uh, people and communities perceive and the experience and and what uh, and, and the priorities of a police force. And here I've really seen uh, human-centered design being applied in a real-world context. That was a fascinating, eye-opening for me to have a look behind the scenes and see how all the six law enforcement agencies were approaching innovation taking into account not just lead users, but also society, communities and groups, uh, and therefore having, a, having a, working on solutions that are multidisciplinary and hopefully sustainable for the future. The most uh, interesting part is working together with, with such a variety, variety of uh, different stakeholders uh, and, and police uh, uh, forces. It's, it's interesting because they are very different in, in those different countries and we could learn from each other. So what I've learned is the, um, the necessity of, um, of uh, asking the end users what they really need for their work so that we don't produce anything for the shelf, the bookshelf. I think that the key word is engaging. Uh, during the CCI uh, project, we realized at the Estonian Police and Border Guard Board how important it is to engage end users. Um, I think I've learned uh, from CCI project the relevance of a problem definition. So uh, what we've heard and read quite often in the project was one sentence like um, you fail more often because you solve the wrong problem uh, than because you find the wrong solution for the right problem. So um, what I've take away is that um, it's worth it to spend more time and more thought at the beginning to find a good problem definition. I think I've learned that law enforcement agencies, when given um, the training and given the guidance around design process, can operate as designers just like a design company could. I've learned a lot um, from being on uh, Cutting Crime Impact. Uh, I've actually been through the whole design process, the whole product design process, um, together with the LEA partners, and I've learned such a lot from that. And it makes such a huge difference um, actually going through that process compared to just reading about something in a, in a book. And um, it's that hands-on experience of actually working with law enforcement agencies that make such a big difference to understanding the new product de development process. Commonality of the fact that we don't work in silos, we don't work within our different institutions within the sphere of crime and uh, security and understanding that and understanding the fact that we are humans working with other humans, working with technology has been I think a key to a lot of the tools that have been developed within the CCI project. Everything has surprised me uh, through the CCI project. We've done lots of uh, workshops that have uh, taught us to work in a different way, to think in a different way, and to experience different law enforcement agencies from, again, across Europe has been really interesting to see the different ways they work. Um, we were very surprised about the design that because it was very open-minded and then to find um, the real way for our institution to bring this open-minded into the real context. The exchange of knowledge, that was, that was the most beautiful in this uh, uh, project. Something for me was completely old, old uh, knowledge, but someone else liked it and could use it, but also the other way around, that, that he or she told me something and then I thought, okay, that might be a very good idea. So that exchange is wonderful. What surprised me was finally the tools are also very different in nature. And um, it's, it's a kind of rich collection of different tools that, that, we were, that, that were developed. That was the most surprising thing, I think. It takes a lot of time and um, well, of course, we had a problem with uh, COVID and that, that made it sometimes difficult, but it made it also flexible. With what I've also been impressed by um, is the way in which, because we worked with the um, communication design company, then Loba, um, as part of the consortium, 
And so in some cases, then we had concepts, we had tool solutions, we had materials. And through the work of Loba, um, some of those were transformed into finalized products that are well designed and easy for end users to use. And I was really impressed what a difference um, that process can make. However, it's helped us to influence our senior leaders and for them to start to understand a bit, maybe a more interesting and innovative way of working. So. This methodology inspired EFIS to update the uh, guide to the local uh, safety audit and uh, this human-centered approach and the tools and the methods that have been developed by CCI to really understand what the needs are and what the requirements are for the end user is something that's super helpful for, uh, for this guide that we have as well and that cities can use as well. What it allow us to have a new way of thinking about uh, things, which I find it very interesting and positive because usually uh, on the working days, we are so much focused on things and the project gives us time to stop and uh, try to think what is really the underlying root causes of problems. And this was very interesting. CCI project uh, influenced uh, the work of DPT, the German uh, Prevention Congress, by uh, confirming that uh, acting locally but thinking globally is a good way to go. I think that uh, what has been interesting is seeing others adopt the human-centered approach and uh, clearly it, um, it, it again it, it sort of it chimes with the way um, police officers think I think and the way the people working for our law enforcement partners work um, in that the focus on end users and of delivering something that has real value um, for end users is something that they are quite keen to do. Um, and also that, that some of the partners have managed to really tap into the, the human-centered side of policing. But in the end, you need to find solutions that address the right problems from the start. Uh, being aware of this from the starting point, to focus on the problem, to focus on all the stakeholders, and then build something that works for, to address that problem, uh, that is really uh, something that I'll take along in the next years as a, as a researcher as well. I so hope that the European Commission then looks at some of the results that we've had and listens to the experiences of the LEAs and tries to adopt that approach in more of their research projects because I think it could fundamentally transform um, European security research for the better. All right, so there you had it from the partners of the project. Uh, we can later also discuss uh, the, the consortium and how it was put together and also what the experiences of uh, Caroline and Andrew as project coordinators are with that type of um, uh, partners that they had and, and how the dynamic was. Because I think this is, as you also saw from the video, one of the main um, aspects where everybody who was involved in the project was was really happy with but at the same time of course looking forward or looking towards what this could mean for other projects and other type of research uh, we could ask ourselves whether also additional partners from other types of backgrounds uh, should involved should be involved in similar projects and and how that works out and I think there's also one of these broader questions generally in the in the um, yeah, as a, as a very basic question, so whose task is which part of security and how does this work, especially because CCI is also focused very much on, um, from the outset, what is often being described as petty crime, although of course we have a lot of thoughts about that as well, and especially Caroline and Andrew. Um, I also see in the chat that the first uh, questions are already coming in, but uh, please, uh, if you have any question or something on your mind, uh, put it in there so we have a bit of space for discussion at the end and we would like to use that and uh, now it is time for um, more thinking about this human-centered uh, design approach 
again, uh, Caroline and Andrew will uh, share their thoughts uh, on this with us and how, how we worked as a, as a project on this. But uh, generally speaking, of course, human-centered design is a very hot topic at the moment, especially also in the field of technology regulation. If you think about artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, it, it plays a very big role in the security sector, probably more with um, uh, facial recognition. So Caroline and Andrew, can I maybe uh, invite you again to join us and to um, uh, to share uh, your presentation on human-centered design? I see it's already popping up. Wonderful. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Oscar. Um, yes, we'd like to present the European security model. Uh, we have developed a human-centered conceptualization of security, and we'd like to go through that with you today. So, why did CCI go about developing a European security model? I mean, the concept of a security model seems to be rather abstract, you could say, um, but the need for it was actually defined in the European Security Programme in the funding call uh, from Horizon 2020 that CCI was going for. And so um, what they said was that we should define a European security model, and they gave a little bit of background um, about how they saw that looking. So that's what CCI obviously tried to do. Now, in terms of what we found, um, then it was a little bit different to what we expected. Um, so the CCI consortium then undertook research to understand uh, the European security model in its current form. Um, so we reviewed the literature and we also conducted um, interviews with security practitioners and with policy makers. Um, because um, we had been expecting to be able to find this European security model, um, what we actually found instead were some documents which seem to relate um, to a European security model and to um, use the term secure, security model but there didn't actually seem to be a European security model itself. Um, that's because partly uh, we were expecting to find some kind of diagram or some kind of model, which is uh, what one normally expects. So we then identified this gap in the research um, in terms of a European security model. Thank you, Caroline. So. Um... Having reviewed the literature, we also undertook some interviews with various uh, security experts to talk about a European security model. And what was what we found was interesting was that people actually, a number of people actually claimed that they had seen a European security model at some stage or that it had been in some uh, an earlier document. Um, and so we had this uh, concept that it was a bit like the Yeti. Uh, in the sense that there was a number of uh, sightings of this um, mythological creature, but um, there wasn't any photographic evidence as far as we could find. Um, so having done the interviews and double checked and, and we're aware that there was moves towards creating something, I think in the early 2000s, uh, I think at one point there was a committee, um, but uh, I think other events uh, took over and in fact, we decide that this idea of a, a, a European security model Yeti, we, we put it to rest. So um, we then uh, decided that what we needed to do as CCI was to develop something of our own. And so uh, uh, in terms of developing a CCI European security model, we then had to sort of, sort of think about where we would start with that. So just initially, um, first, in terms of uh, uh, clarifying some terms, um, a model, what do we mean by a model? Um, as uh, this quote from von Neumann makes clear, this is uh, modeling is something that's very common in the sciences. Um, it's something that's done uh, in order to uh, make uh, complex com uh, concepts more easy to understand. So uh, conceptual model might, modeling might mean a number of things. 
Um, but basically, it's the activity of formally describing some aspect of the physical and social world for the purposes of understanding, uh, but also for the purposes of communication. And uh, visual modeling, as Caroline said, we were expecting when we started looking to see a, a visual model, it is actually a useful way of trying to understand issues. Uh, and it's great for uh, being able to better understand systems and structures and relationships uh, within a complex uh, situation. But it's also great for being able to communicate with different people involved, different stakeholders, different disciplines, uh, people from different domains, etc. And building these sort of visual models uh, involves abstraction from a complex system uh, to a, a model that can be represented generally uh, on a 2D piece of paper or a, a slide like, like we're presenting today. Uh, and this abstraction process uh, is something that we've talked about in our work with the partners in terms of design, because uh, this idea of abstraction is something that designers do when looking to develop new ideas, uh, to look at the situation and to try and abstract from it in order to reconfigure elements and come up with uh, something that might be a new to the world solution. So it's a fundamental human capability that enables humans to deal better with complexity. And so models are effectively abstractions that portray uh, the essentials of a system or a structure. So the details are filtered out that makes the complex problem easier to understand. So our challenge was to effectively develop a conceptual model using visual modeling of the concept European security. Um, and we undertook a design lab uh, with our partners. So this is a collaborative workshop with the CCI uh, consortium to actually look at this issue and to explore this issue of uh, what do we mean by, uh, well, first of all, what do we mean by security? And what do we mean by European security? And so we did work with various frameworks using post-it notes uh, and uh, we had to do this work online unfortunately because of covid uh, but we are we split the group into different teams and we looked at uh, the concept of european security and tried to break it down uh, into a framework that would enable us to try and get some insight from the various members of our consortium and from the analysis of this design lab work, uh, we were able to uh, better understand uh, aspects of uh, European security. So we looked at challenges, we looked at obstacles to European security, and we looked at what might be guiding principles for European security. And basically, in the, in the process of doing this, we came up with a view on uh, European security strategy and research focus as it is, as we saw it being currently focused. So, uh, sorry, as it, we saw it being currently formulated. So this was a sort of view from CCI. And the perception was that um, there's a focus on big, scary issues. So terrorism, disasters, organized crime. There's some focus on uh, what they call petty crime. And there's uh, some focus on uh, citizens' feelings of insecurity. And when we look at uh, where practitioners and end users are, they tend to be situated over in this uh, domain. Whereas when we look at where citizens are and their concerns, it tends to be more in this sort of area. And these, um, when we think about security research, these often result in uh, lots of tools that tend to be quite technology centered, but also we found uh, from a, uh, the review that was conducted, they tend to be quite transient in, in that some of the tools that may have been developed relatively recently uh, to address security are actually not accessible anymore or, or are quite difficult to find. So, um, we came up with a number of propositions in relation to a conceptual model of European security. The first one um, was that for petty crime to be addressed, and uh, that was the remit of the CCI project, was to address petty crime. So for petty crime to be addressed, any model should be citizen focused because having this bottom up focus, so focused around citizens, pretty much guarantees that petty crime will be addressed. Um, 
Secondly, we suggested that concerns around citizen trust and perceptions of legitimacy regarding security echo wider political concerns. We're aware that this idea of legitimacy and trust uh, is being somewhat hijacked by uh, right wing concerns, let's say, to push against um, greater uh, cooperation across Europe. Um, and that this is being fed by concerns of, uh, of illegitimacy, perhaps of, of institutions at European level uh, and lack of trust. Thirdly, we thought that security problems and priorities, well, they change over time so that, so that there's no point building a model around what is the priority today because the, tomorrow the model will then be out of date. So we felt that the model should be crime agnostic is how we termed it. So uh, it should be not focused on a particular security problem, but rather um, uh, it shouldn't be focused around uh, specific crimes or security issues. Uh, fourthly, that economic benefit so uh, we know that the eu refers to the security economy and there's a the idea that the uh, horizon uh, program and now the horizon europe program is about helping uh, the benefit uh, economic benefit of the security economy but we felt that economic benefit actually flows from implemented solutions so the emphasis should be placed on implementation much more so on developing the right solution that addresses the right problem in the right context of use uh, if you have good uh, solutions they'll be implemented and that will create an economic benefit and finally uh, we proposed that there was a european difference to security as it is conceived and performed in europe um, that there's a european flavor to security that's different from uh, that that might be in the West if we go to the United States or in the East if we go that way. So that there's a sort of European exceptionalism with how we termed it. So we started our model on this basis with the idea of European values. Now from various documents we can see um, European values are, are mentioned. So we have things like freedom and fundamental human rights, democratic control, transparency and accountability, dialogue, equality, justice and the rule of law, truth and integrity, respect for ethics. And to this, we added this idea of uh, the European difference or European exceptionalism. So we thought this, these values, this was core to uh, European security. So that became the base of our model. From these values, then, we derived principles of European security. Uh, and we had uh, five of these. The first being citizen-centered. So European security is citizen-centered in that it is organized around uh, human needs and priorities. The second principle was that uh, European security should be transdisciplinary. Um, about engaging with and working across multiple disciplines, seeking others' expertise and worldviews, and valuing holistic approaches. The third principle would be preventative. So European security is preventative. It's about prioritizing prevention. It's proactive, it's strategic and intelligent, and it's about preventing harm. The fourth principle of European security is collaborative. So it's about working together, engaging with partners, recognizing shared problems, goals and interests, creating consortiums, partnerships and teams. And the final and fifth principle is that European security is demonstrable or demonstrable. And this is where it's about being evidence-based, valued, valuing the tested and the demonstrated, it's rational and analysis-driven, it's practical and context-appropriate, and it's evaluated. So from these principles, uh, we then suggested that there would flow uh, strategies. And we came up with a number of strategies that would relate to particular principles. So the first strategy uh, from the citizen-centered principle would be to understand citizen behaviors and perspectives. And this means enabling improved understanding of citizens' experience, perceptions and behaviours to be able to better address problems and to be able to create appropriate and acceptable, acceptable solutions. The second strategy would be to promote 
and support community-based approaches. So to be citizen-centered by enabling and empowering EU citizens to contribute to security. And this includes supporting community-based initiatives in member states that attempt to co-op co citizens in the creation of safe and secure neighborhoods. On the transdisciplinary principle, we suggest the first strategy might be to engage and benefit from all disciplines. So this means recognizing the benefits of engaging a broad range of disciplines in tackling complex societal challenges and contexts and supporting transdisciplinary action. Security is not just a criminal justice role. The second principle here might be to meaningfully engage civil society. So valuing and ensuring genuine engagement with civil society in scoping and addressing security issues. From the preventative principle, we suggest the first strategy would be to promote and support preventative approaches. So promoting proactive prevention activities and supporting the development of improved strategic capability in effectively preventing security issues. And the second strategy would be to identify emerging and future problems. So developing an understanding of emerging problems and supporting development of appropriate preparedness for future challenges. On the collaborative principle, we suggest uh, the first strategy would be to address problems across states. So recognizing the shared nature of problems and goals, supporting problem solving across member states to address cross-border and transnational issues, supporting member states to work together to improve effectiveness in tackling common problems. The second strategy would be to share solutions across member states and agencies. So this is supporting the sharing of solutions across member states and between the various agencies involved in creating security. And the third strategy here being to promote and support partnership working, so encouraging and enabling inter-organization working partnerships and collaborations to more effectively tackle security issues. And then the demonstrable principle, the first strategy would be actions around understanding problems and context. So supporting and enabling the improved systemic understanding and framing of problems through high quality contextual research that provides real insight and understanding. The second principle being to prototype test with end users. So maximizing the feasibility, practicality and acceptability of solutions through prototype testing with end users early and often and thereby supporting implementation. And the third um, strategy here would be to assess impact and share what works and why. So supporting practical assessment of policies, strategies and solutions to better understand what works, why it works, and to share this with relevant practitioners and stakeholders. So here we have a model that is based on European values, what we termed cultural values, from which we derive value-based principles. And upon these principles, we proposed principle-based strategies for action. And with this principle strategic action, um, it would be undertaken by practitioners and they'd be taking this principle based action based around the needs of European citizens. So then we thought in terms of the European Commission, what might be the European Commission's role in such a uh, security model? So we thought, well, fundamentally, they are at the centre and we call them guardian of the flame of the European Enlightenment. So they're about maintaining and protecting these European values. So their role would be to promote these values through these principles and to support principled action through these strategies and to improve capability of practitioners to take such principled action and fundamentally to deliver positive societal impact for citizens and to create European security. So that's the model, Caroline. Thank you, Andrew. 
So this conceptual model then of European security, we feel this presents a coherent framework for European security strategies in the context of being value-based principles and principle-based action. And what it would do is to allow a structured critical assessment of the breadth of security strategy, including, of course, looking at the European research programme itself. It provides a framework for future security research topics and areas. Um, it's a vision for research, um, but underpinning it are these fundamental European values. We think it also communicates the breadth of security policymaker and law enforcement roles and supports service and capability development. It raises questions as to the appropriateness of security policy focusing on these narrow, high profile risks, these scary issues um, that Andrew referred to, and also of um, the dangers of failing to address some of these broader issues, the everyday crimes uh, that impact citizens' uh, daily lives, so-called petty crime. So we, we think that petty crime is implicit within the European security model. Um, and the reason for this is that to be citizen-centered, security must address the problems that are impacting citizens' quality of life. And these are, or include, the everyday crimes that citizens experience and also the feelings of insecurity that they um, have. We also think that transdisciplinary approaches are already used significantly um, to understand petty crime. Uh, we can see that in particular with regard to crime prevention through urban design and planning, which brings together many disciplines and only works effectively if it makes use of these different uh, disciplines. We think that the principle of prevention is key to tackling petty crime and reducing harm to citizens. It's much better if a crime does not occur in the first place. And we know that prevention is certainly possible in, with regard to everyday crime. There is so much good practice around for tackling petty crime, and that should be shared across member states and between practitioners and policymakers. We really do have an evidence base of what works and why in addressing crime. Um, but obviously what we know is that the nature of crime changes and new knowledge needs to be developed and shared. So we very much think that petty crime should be addressed within uh, European security. And as I said, we believe that petty crime is implicit within the European security model. So thank you very much. If anybody's got any questions, we're very happy to answer those either now or later as you see fit, Oscar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting discussion indeed. We do have questions relating to uh, the model already, but uh, I, I would suggest that first we turn to our uh, next uh, program point, which is the video with the insights from the uh, members of the Advisory Council. Um, as uh, our hosts are preparing that, there's just two uh, brief remarks from my side, which I find so. What you what this flame, which is relating to the European Commission, right? From a from a legal perspective of European law, the European Commission is being referred to as the guardian of the treaties. So actually, that 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 fits perfectly well and wonderful, uh, also from a legal perspective. And what I also um, say as a bit more of a lighter remark is that in the end, when we design those models. We turn to the ancient Greek temple, so apparently there is something very right about that uh, design. It's a very classic design that seems to work for all kinds of things, at least uh, to me as a layman in design, that is the, is the impression. But uh, yeah, we have uh, the opportunity to talk about that um, after this uh, video. And uh, yeah, we have already a couple of questions, but please, uh, if you have some, uh, feel free to share them with us and then and now we look uh, at what the members of the advisory uh, board have to share with regards to CCI.
The approach of CCI has been one of the key factors for its success. The approach focuses on people with a holistic and open-minded view of safety and security issues. These factors, together with the le high level of competence of the participants and a very good organization and communication, led to a natural and very pleasant flow of the different activities. The result is perfectly visible in the high quality of the products. The toolkits are extremely well designed and will be an important support for practitioners. In recent years, a lot of theory has been developed about safety and security. CCI has perfectly put into practice the most recent theoretical indications. Working with, you, with all of you has been a real pleasure. Considering my experience in the advisory board during the CCI project, I really appreciate the attention devoted to the contextualized feature of local place and of local crime prevention strategies, moving from, from the search of universal solution among them on, on the technological one to more human-centered solution and as a consequence more local tailored solution. And I was uh, luckily to take part in the, uh, well, the advisory board of the project, which, well, is of course very nice because you can follow up on the project from a short distance. And uh, I have to say I have been involved in quite a number of European projects, but when compared, I think the Cutting Crime Impact Project has been one of my favorites. And I don't say this because I'm being interviewed, but I really think uh, it was a, a perfect project in the sense that uh, many concrete products and instruments were, were well, were uh, gathered together and th th that came out of the CCI project. So it was, as far as I'm concerned, a concrete a project with, with, with very good products. And in my opinion, uh, many of those products can really be used to at least try to reduce crime and the fear of crime at a European level. I think they were quite professional when, 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 when they were presented during the final uh, conference in Brussels uh, at the end of November. So the, the, the thing I like most about the project, I think that's called drive. Drive from all the participants and partners to make it a success uh, under very difficult, of course, COVID-19 circumstances. So I, w I was quite surprised how, how, how well the, the project at the final end was managed and, and, and which came out of it. And then, well, finally, I have to say the work being done by, let's call them the leaders of the project, Andrew Wooten and Caroline Davy, well, it was more than perfect. So I would say to them, a great job being done. And uh, I really enjoyed working with uh, you on uh, the CCI project. CCI provided security policy makers with a full package of important lessons. If I have to choose one, that would be the knowledge that should be acquired anyway, that security issues are complex rather than difficult. Abraham Maslow once said that if you only have a hammer, all your problems will be nails. CCI can show to policy makers how security problems can be approached and tackled in a more efficient way and efficiency means better results with the same or even less efforts. CCI outputs represent the, then a set of tools that any security advisor should be provided with. My humble opinion, the most important lesson learned during the CCI project is to invest more attention and more resources to human-centered solutions that are sensitive to local context, rather than looking for more secure and safer public spaces we should perhaps explore um, adequate ways to ensure a minimum standard of urban security acceptable for all the component of civil society, above all women, elderly, young people and minorities. Okay, I think this is a good question. Uh, I, I myself, I, I am a policy maker within the Dutch Ministry of Justice, so I, I well, I know quite a lot about translating uh, projects into policies and practice. And um, the first thing I noticed about the CCI project that, that it is really worthwhile investing wisely in crime prevention. Uh, the projects really showed off on, on that way. So again, uh, 
in my opinion, the CCI came out with many concrete examples how innovative and crime prevention programs can really make a difference and contributing to a reducing crime and, and making European countries more safe. And I don't say this because these are nice words, because, well, I, I have quite some experience working in the field of, of policy making. And I really think uh, the, the, the products that came out of the project can, can, can make a difference. So I will advise policymakers to really uh, make use of the products that came out of it, uh, because there is evidence on what works in crime prevention. And again, the products and the program shows that it's not, this is not always rocket science. So sometimes some of those measures and innovations can quite easily be uh, implemented. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and now it is uh, time for the discussion. We already have a, a couple of questions. And I would just like to use the questions in order also to stimulate uh, more questions, of course, but also in order to um, talk about a couple of um, yeah basic fundamental uh, questions and and you know how the project is being set up and why why it was set up the way it was. Uh, maybe it is also good to reiterate uh, for those who are not that familiar with the project, you know what the specific areas are and and how to kids look like. Andrew has already given us a, a bit of examples and of course you all, this is the end of the webinar series so you all have all the other recordings uh, to work with and, and delve into more detail if you are um, interested in it and of course there is the uh, Cutting Crime Impact uh, project uh, homepage where you can also find uh, fact sheets relating to the different kind of issues which were part of the project where you can really see like two or three pages what the main findings are, what the main problems are. So there's lots of uh, material available, but we'll also talk about uh, that now a bit. So one of the comments uh, that was in there is uh, from our from our participants today was that uh, manufacturers also need to be part of uh, of the solutions. And I think that actually would uh, is a is an interesting comment in the regard that when we're talking about the um, the setup of the of of this type of research in in europe it's all you know often it's very application and technology uh focused in developing um yeah systems i would i would call them or you know something which we could talk, call call a technical ar artifact even if you want to use such an academic term but also i think a lot of what we saw and what you described in the project and also what the advisory board values is also this maybe more creation of a of a culture so maybe uh, Carolyn and Andrea can invite you to, to to talk about it a little bit and to share your thoughts on it and also because you have so much expertise and working on these types of uh, projects and so much experience I think it would be really interesting to hear from you what you what your thoughts on this are. Um, yes with regard to setting up um, CCI and who the partners were um, we had a situation where we were leaving it open to know what solutions would be developed. So we didn't have a large technology provider within the consortium. Um, so what we actually did was that we had um, a certain amount of budget for each partner so that we could then um, potentially uh, use that to develop whatever solution um, came out of the, the research that was conducted. And um, in terms of some of the um, more um, technology orientated solutions that were developed in CCI, um, we actually were then supported in that by our um, communication design partner. Um, they actually had access to quite a lot of different um, disciplines um, through their consultancy and were able then to support the development of tools. Um, so in theory, I like the idea of um, organizations being involved from the beginning. That certainly worked very well in terms of having a LOBA involved through the whole project as a partner, because then they could really understand the LEAs and what they were trying to achieve. Um, but at the same time, one of the difficulties is um, sometimes you get the feeling that 
um, the solution is, is uh, defined very much in advance and the technology companies are involved obviously right from the beginning and there is no opportunity to really explore needs and requirements um, because the solution is actually already defined. Andrew, you perhaps want to say something to this? Um, yes, I, I, would, I would agree with what you said. I think that part of the issue with this is the way that European research consortium are established. There's a, there's a sort of an established process for you get partners together, you collaboratively uh, uh, come up with an idea of what you want to do. You're normally responding to a, uh, a call that can be quite, um, I mean, some of the calls do look very obviously designed by committee because they may, it may involve a lot of internal contradictions within particular calls or, or jargon that clearly the people on the committee writing the call understood but don't necessarily make it apparent to, you know, especially to non-English speakers. Um, and then you're expected to put together a consortium to go for the funding. Well, of course, in the reality, um, you often don't know what the problem is. And so then, in a way, it might be better to have a different process whereby the first stage, uh, and we built the CCI project upon the idea that there was a, a gap in this understanding the problem issue. And so we put the proposal in saying that we wanted a certain amount of money for tool development, but we didn't say in the proposal what those tools would actually be. So we knew that was a slight risk, um, but we were very pleased that the uh, commission went with that. Um, because often you find in a proposal for research funding, they almost define what the what they're going to produce at the end in the mm. proposal. So it becomes um, more of a development project than a research project, if you like. Um, and we wanted to make this about helping build the capacity of our law enforcement partners to better understand the often quite complex problems that they had. And that luckily, we were very pleased that all of the partners came along with us on that. And actually a lot of them brought initial ideas to the table um, that they then were happy to put to one side and do some requirements capture. Uh, and I think in all cases, I think I'm right in saying, Caroline, that the initial idea didn't end up being the one that they went with because having done this requirements capture research with end users, often using quite sort of ethnographic methods of trying to understand problems, it would reveal much more interesting <laughs> problems at, that they weren't aware of that they could then tackle. So, uh, and in a number of cases, that's what the partners have done. And so I think, um, uh, uh, not to be long-winded about it, but in terms of having a manufacturer involved, you're more or less committing yourself to producing something that that manufacturer produces. It would be better to have a pool of manufacturers that you would go to at the stage of design development, if you like, so after you've done the front-end work, that you could then say, right, we need someone, this is one of the problems, we want um, something around AI or something around uh, the, you know, this, and we, and then you could actually bring partners in with the understanding that they knew what was being produced was actually, uh, as has been said with that Akoff quote, you're actually solving the right problem. Um, mm. So that was that. Was, so we were lucky with CCI that we were able to put together a project which said we want a lump of money and we don't know what we're going to do with it yet, but trust us, we'll find out. And, uh, and that was, I think, a lot of it was about convincing the commission that the process we were going through was going to be well managed enough that we would get something out. The other mm. thing that we did yeah. have was we had four focus areas so they knew quite clearly it was going to be on predictive policing, community policing, crime prevention through urban design and planning and measuring and mitigating citizens feelings of insecurity and so it wasn't that everything sounded open that there was some focus points and there was a very clear process um, and also we do have the um, experience to be able to take LEA partners through that that design process that we, we took them through. But um, what I'm saying is that there's no solution was identified. No, there wasn't. That was no, no, very true. No. Because what we actually did was that um, after the um, design labs, and uh, we came up with solution directions um, and for each LEA, there was between one or four, one to four solution directions. 
and so they actually had options and um, the LEAs were very good at looking at those options and deciding you know what would be the most valuable what would be feasible within the time frame of the project uh, what suited the you know the current circumstances within the LEA and they were mm -hmm. very good then at making a choice about um, going with then a particular um, solution um, direction to develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what, what I what I also hear from is is that um, uh, you also probably there is a bit more space of trust for that the institutions who really have to put it in their work are able to figure that out as they go along. So that is one thing. But the other thing is also that often we tend to and I think this is something which has been mentioned several uh, times today already, but often you tend to think uh, about when we're talking about security or, or even a European security model, or, or that's the next point I would like to come to this concept of petty crime. Uh, there is an established understanding, but actually if you have the space and the time and the expertise to think about this, then you see that actually what is there in terms of a shared understanding, especially across disciplines and different cultures and different countries, is actually not so much <laughs> and requires a bit more of uh, thinking and elaboration. So we have a question here, uh, particularly on this, on this petty crime concept, which I know you've also looked into a lot because CCI from the outset has been associated um, with this term that uh, so one of the colleagues says that uh, one of the priorities of Europol so the agency which is attached to the European Commission dealing with police cooperation in the European Union is uh, organized property crime which actually mostly deals with mobile organized crime groups traveling around Europe and committing burglaries uh, pickpocketing uh, vehicle theft maybe um, etc so, and and then the, the the colleague outlines so there's an intersection between organized and and, and petty crime. Um, so what are your thoughts on the on this uh, intersection of petty crime with serious crime, or or how should we think about that? I mean there there is an intersection, and I think this is a, a very interesting question. That um, I mean from our point of view, I mean from a human centered design point of view. Um, it's not really so important to us whether something is a petty crime or an organized crime. We would be looking at the practitioners um, that are trying to achieve something, um, so trying to deal with a particular problem. And so we would then look at how to help them do that. And obviously, um, we would then need to understand whether it's, you, you might well need to understand whether it's a petty crime or whether it has an organized crime element to it. But it, mm. I mean, from a human-centered design point of view, that would be less of an issue. Um, I found it quite interesting looking at, um, there's some recent uh, guidance that's come out, which is about um, dealing with uh, pickpocketing, for instance. And because it's then, um, well, I assume because it's then uh, funded at an EU level, then the focus is very much on the organized crime element um, of pickpocketing and um, which is fine uh, because it's obviously it's looking at particular contexts where the particular danger then um, is organized uh, pickpocketing. Um, but from our point of view, um, then what we would want to do is to focus on the practitioners and to support them in what they in, in what they are doing. And so understanding that relationship between then um, the organized element and the non-organized element would be relevant to it. Um, but in some cases, a lot of the solutions are actually applicable to all, si all, all different types of crime. Um, for instance, how you stop burglary um, is a lot through the security of you know, buildings and uh, that can hinder both organized criminals and you know, less professional criminals. So, yeah. So, so I, so I think it, it depends very much on the context. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think I it's not a distinction we would normally make. I don't. We only mm -hmm. made the distinction because it's in the call for the proposal. So, um, I don't think that there is a and and actually something that we found 
um, when doing some of the work around, um, for example, community policing, uh, was that a lot of the, uh, and when you're looking at things like uh, counter radicalization work, that relies on having really good community engagement. Uh, and often that isn't very good because they're not dealing with community issues very well, like community policing. So something that might be petty crime focused like community policing is actually a tool for enabling uh, you know, better intelligence gathering around counter-terrorism or actually enabling, you know, counter-radicalization work. So there isn't mm. really a distinction. I think the distinction comes in when you're actually looking to address the problem. And if you've identified that the bulk of your uh, burglary is being done by gangs uh, transient and coming in using the motorway and then driving out again, then clearly where you would tackle that problem, uh, it might be less at the individual dwelling point of view but it might be actually more about how you intervene on road networks or how you get intelligence about, you know, who's moving where in terms of criminal gangs. So I think mm. there, there is a, it, there's a, it bleeds together. And, and I, this is where I think the distinction um, that we were, we were given this in the call to focus on petty crime is a bit of a false one. Uh, but it did enable us then to uh, with all of our uh, six law enforcement agencies for them to focus on what worked for them uh, in their particular context. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. So we, we have a, um, a couple more questions uh, and I think so we have about 13 minutes left. So if we, um, I think it's very interesting what you're sharing in terms of insight, but I think we can take all of them if we try to uh, answer them quite focused in a and so um but leading uh, or continuing from what you just said both uh, one colleague says as far as i've understood the project focused on leas as uh, end users have you developed community based approaches for local municipalities too because i maybe i i'm sure you can share uh, something with that regard for instance with neighborhood policing community policing Yes, I mean, I think we focused on the LEAs as the end users, if you like, of CCI. But when they did their requirements capture work, the first thing we did was a workshop around stakeholder mapping. So that was identifying who were the stakeholders or end users in the particular uh, in the particular focus area that they were looking at. Um, and so we had four focus areas um, of uh, predictive policing, community policing, uh, crime prevention through urban design and planning and citizens feelings of insecurity and so clearly things like community policing and feelings of insecurity the end user is the citizen in most of those cases um, and so that was where the research was done uh, either the citizen or even external partners that they're working with in the community and that was where some of the tools are focused on how to actually make those you know what was going wrong in those relationships that was hindering that so the end user is a term that, again, it's something that was passed down from the EU. And I think possibly the EU do think of that in terms of law enforcement agencies, but we didn't limit that to the case. It was only, in a sense, the end user of, LA, of um, CCI in terms of who's creating the tools was our partners, but who they, who they would be used by was often mixed. Is there something you would like to add to that point as well, Caroline? Um, no, I mean, just to say that um, in terms of the LEAs, as Andrew said, um, some um, needed a tool that was very much focused on their own senior managers, others needed a tool that enabled them to gauge with local citizens, um, so it, it was really quite quite variable. I think the, the main thing that we do within CCI is that we use the term um, end user in a very disciplined way in the sense that the end user is the end user of the tool um, mm -hmm. it is not the whole lea um, it is um, the end user might be for instance a um, a police officer or a community police officer or senior management or shift managers it's it's really we are quite specific in defining who those end users are, and they are those that are, are using using the tools. Mm -hmm. But I think often the word end users is sort of bandied about a bit without actually thinking in enough detail um, about who who that is and and their relationship to the tool. And obviously, you can have 
um, people that are uh, related to the tool that are not directly using it and and you must understand and be clear about those uh, relationships mm -hmm. um, all right so yeah maybe maybe very briefly uh, the question which just came in so what measurement or monitoring tools uh, is CCI using to assess the impact of uh, implementing the I think the I think we could start with the toolkits and then maybe also thinking because the end of the discussion will move more towards the European security model. So how do we measure toolkits in terms of um, how do we measure impact in terms of the toolkits we use and how do we measure impact or what, what is going to be the next steps in terms of implementation if something like that exists for the European security model? Yes, I think in relation to the tools, I think it's probably easier to be honest because a lot of the implementation has actually started um, during CCI. And so uh, what we tend to do is that we have various um, tasks that are outlined um, in the grant agreement um, and that allows us then to quite clearly map exactly what has been done to support implementation. And so we can do things like we can know, OK, um, the tool was demonstrated. We know with whom and with how many people it was demonstrated. We know that workshops were conducted to support implementation. We know who they were conducted with. Um, and what we need to do after um, CCI has finished is to con continue to monitor uh, the actual implementation um, and the uptake of the tools. And because we have a lot of information about how the tools are embedded within each LEA, um, then I think that that should be uh, perfectly possible then to do. Um, the other thing that we would obviously like to do is that um, these tools were developed specifically for our LEA partners, but we think it, they might well be relevant to other LEAs in other countries. And so we are sharing the um, tools and we're doing that um, through the various events and things that we've had, but also through the web portals that we're setting up uh, through CCI. And so we would be really appreciated to, if um, it does inform practice or policy within other organizations that they do get in contact and let us know so that we can really monitor then the impact of the CCI project. All right, so um, with regards uh, to the European security model now specifically, um, I think the first question that we could tackle is uh, generally thinking about petty crime and how to respond to security. It's also something which came, I think, already from your presentation. Um, whether one of the strategies is to put more resources to social and economic uh, uh, resource uh, to, to social and economic circumstances that exist in a community here it says in a member state but probably we are more since we work with different types of uh, law enforcement agencies but it's often also very based on on what is the need of the community or a region right um, and I think one of the questions that appeared from time to time also is something that we saw as a as a consortium or as a as a, a group of uh, people thinking about these issues with different backgrounds uh, coming up was, is this still a task of the police or is it actually a, a different type of problem? Um, so what would you say from your experiences with the project in general as, as researchers about this uh, distinction of, you know, something, a task of the police which requires a, a security tool or a, or a gun, to put it very bluntly, or is it more about how we shape the environment in the in the first place? Andrew, I think you're muted. Sorry, schoolboy error. Sorry. Um, I can answer in terms of the European security model. I would just say that um, it's being put forward because when we started the project, we assumed there was a security model somewhere. And our, our original task was to effectively extend it to include uh, petty crime. 
Um, but what we've ended up doing is defining something based on a review of literature and interviews, but also with working with the consortium. And we did an activity at the final conference as well to sort of validate some of the ideas. Um, and so we use the term, um, we have uh, obviously values, principles, and uh, we have strategies now. And what we've suggested is that the, that the actions that are taken to fulfill those strategies are many and varied, and they may involve, you know, uh, moving, uh, they may involve human effort, they may involve technologies, they may involve financial instruments. And I think, you know, something like prevention, there's a lot of research that shows that, you know, social inequality and stuff drives criminality, that there's relationships between def deprivation and and I think these things are about prevention. So that is a legitimate strategy that, uh, sorry, legitimate action that might support the strategy of um, of, of prevention. Some of the things we've outlined. Um, and so when we didn't design the the model is a conceptual model of security, and it was meant to basically try and map the domain rather than a to do list, if you like. So um, in terms of who takes action on it. It was something that we put forward as being a way to maybe better structure and better conceptualize European security so that we're not just focusing on, you know, technology approaches or just focusing on, as we mentioned before, big, scary issues. But we're looking at the broader domain of security at, and in terms of then that gives us more scope to be able to take action, I think. So that's mm -hmm. the sort of purpose of the model. Caroline. I mean, yes, just to say with regard to whether the focus should be on um, crime issues or on other social issues, um, I mean, one of the things that we've certainly found through CCI, because um, the um, one of the focus areas was community policing, is re regards the range of different issues that um, law enforcement agencies actually have to deal with. Um, a lot of them are not actually related to crime, they're re related to, you know, to social issues. Um, the police are very much um, the um, agency of last resort for people who've got um, problems. And so um, police officers deal with so many different issues. And that's, you know, something that we're, we're very much aware of. Um, the other thing is that um, CCI looked at feelings of insecurity. And again, feelings of insecurity are not all related to crime and victim victimization. They're to do with um, obviously the um, environment in which people are um, moving about in, whether they feel comfortable there, how well lit it is, etc. Um, but it's mm -hmm. also the, the stories that people hear, you know, in the media. And so there are you have to look quite closely at the issues that have been dealt with and you have to understand those um, and, um, and, and be aware that um, the focus isn't just, just on crime. I mean, our personal experience, I think, from CCI is that the uh, law enforcement agencies know that and the ones that we've worked with can deal with a whole range of issues. Um, mm whether they should do or not um i think that's more of a political question mm. but they don't they don't do that on their own anyway they do that in partnership with with other agencies but the advantage mm. you have with the police is that they are the organizations that will step in and do something uh when there's a, a real problem mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much. There were uh, two more questions which also have to do with the opera opera how to uh, put the European security model in practice, to use a more simple term. But uh, I'm, a, I'm aware of the time and I'm also aware that our uh, hosts uh, would like to still pass on a couple of messages. So thank you very much from my side. I Again, I enjoyed uh, working on the project a lot. And um, yes, thank you for the uh, opportunity to join you today. Margot. Yes, thank you very much, Oscar. Unfortunately, the time is over. So uh, thanks a lot to today's speakers, but also to the speakers from our previous webinars in this series. I know that some of you are here today. And of course, uh, thank you to the attendees for your interest. We hope you enjoyed it. On behalf of the DPT, I can say that it was a pleasure.
And um, we have spoken to our keynote uh, speaker, Dr. Raphael Bosong. In the meantime, he's very sorry that he could not attend and uh, sends his best regards. So normally this is where I uh, yeah, usually announce the next uh, CCI webinar, but it's, uh, as already mentioned, not only the end of the year 2021, but also the end of the project. Uh, new tasks and projects await us next year. Um, we hope that the idea and uh, the, the mission of the project uh, not only emerged at European level, but uh, also that the results will now be received at uh, European level where necessary. So we've talked about how we can implement the developed tools sustainably and so on. So I believe uh, that this can succeed. We would be very happy to see some of you again in our other webinars or on the German Prevention Congress, which uh, take place annually in Germany. And uh, now we wish you all a very happy and peaceful seasonal holiday. Stay, stay healthy and uh, goodbye. <music>